Thank you all for coming. This is Hacking G Suite, the power of dark app script magic. A little bit of background on myself. I'm Matthew Bryant. Uh, you know, I go often by my handle, mandatory. I currently lead the red team effort at Snapchat. And outside of, you know, work, I also post occasionally about security on Twitter at I am mandatory. And additionally, I also do hacking write-ups and, you know, research posts at uh, my website, thehackerblog.com. So to start us off with some context and background, sort of give a base to what we'll be talking about today. So Google Workspace, for those of you who aren't familiar, essentially, this is the new name that they've given to G Suite. I know it can be tough to keep up with all of Google's like ever you know, changing brand guidelines and stuff. Uh, I will still be referring to this as G Suite throughout the talk, just because I think most people are more familiar with G Suite than Google Workspace. But you know, what G Suite is essentially is it's sort of the suite of Google services that people use, you know, things like Gmail, Drive, Calendar, you know, all that stuff. Um, this is available both for like regular users, you know, like personal you know, individuals, as well as like, you know, companies, enterprises. And, you know, this allows people to sort of, you know, if, if it's a company, for example, they can collaborate online to get work done using all the various Google services. And at the time, as of the time of this research, they were boasting like over 2 billion users. So a ton, a ton, a ton of people use this stuff. So for those of you who aren't familiar with AppScript, uh, AppScript is essentially this like, you know, basically JavaScript language, which is used to write these serverless JavaScript apps that run on Google infrastructure. And it's kind of this like custom, you know, way to build apps where it's highly, you know, optimized for automating Google services. It comes with a lot of really useful libraries when it comes to like automating everything from like, you know, Google Docs to Gmail to any sort of Google service you can think of. And on top of having all these pre-built libraries, it has you know this seamless integration with Google's app registration system and sort of their OAuth system. So you know normally when you set up like a new OAuth app with Google, you have to you know set up like you know the callback URI and like configure your app to work with it and all sorts of these all sorts of these things. But when you use App Script, that's all sort of magically done for you. All this authorization stuff is just sort of handled and it sort of like automatically takes care of it. So uh, it also offers a variety of uh, you know, triggers that you can use to start your little scripts that you write. So everything from like, you know, somebody hits a web endpoint that kicks off a script to they, you know, they've opened a Google doc and something's running at the beginning of that um, to like, you know, scheduled cron, you know, sort of like cron style things where you have like scheduled execution jobs and stuff of that nature. This is an example screenshot of the, you know, App Script Editor. You can see it's like a, actually a pretty full, you know, IDE environment. It has everything from, you know, code completion to like, you know, breakpoints, debugging, all the stuff that you'd kind of expect from your regular dev. So Google's OAuth system is very similar to a lot of the other you know, OAuth systems out there. Essentially, the idea is it's it's a system that's built to you know sort of allow these like third-party apps built by you know whatever individuals to request access to resources that Google that Google users have in their account. So like, for example, you know, maybe I have some Google Docs in my account and I want to automate something uh, using for these Google Docs using a third party app. This allows me to basically delegate access to my Google Docs to this third party app to do that for me. Right. So these permissions to these resources, they're essentially known as scopes and there are over 250 of them. And so these are for all the various Google services that you can think of, right? So everything from like, you know, BigQuery, Gmail, Google Docs, stuff like that. And the way that it works, right, is you sort of, your app will redirect them to an authorization prompt that gives them like a, a brief summary of what you're requesting uh, permission-wise. And the user can like kind of think it over and decide, yep, I'm going to allow that or no, I'm going to reject that. And if they allow it, essentially, you know, your app gets handed some tokens, which you can then use to like, you know, talk to these APIs authenticated as the user. So as I, you know, I mentioned that prompt earlier, this is what that looks like. You have like a sort of a human readable little summary here. And in this case, you know, this example app, it has, you know, hey, this is gonna request access. And if you allow it, it'll have access to your, you know, your Gmail stuff. It'll have access to Google Cloud and everything in it. And uh, also it's asking for permission to sort of run when you're not present. So it's not just like a one-time thing. Uh, in the future, it could just kind of keep running, um, you know, indefinitely. So tying all these concepts together and thinking about things at you know higher level, uh, this becomes a pretty attractive option when it comes to targeting you know organizations or companies that are you know sort of on the G Suite stack. Uh, AppScript becomes 
pretty attractive option for things like fishing, you know, like targeted spear fishing, as well as like you say, you've already compromised, you know, like an individual, you know, employee account in a G Suite org, uh, it becomes a very attractive option for backdooring that account as well. And the reason why it's an attractive option is because, you know, an, if you have an app script implant, it's actually sort of outside of the eyes of like, you know, all of the regular like machine monitor controls that run on people's end machines and their laptops and stuff. You know, so like regular antivirus, their endpoint detection tooling and sort of on-device monitoring, none of that's really effective here because again, it runs completely on Google's infrastructure. It's like a total serverless environment. So they don't have any visibility into that at all. And, you know, even better, you know, if your victim like wipes their laptop for some reason, your implant is completely unaffected. It just it, it totally remains uh, with full access to their account. So another thing that's interesting, if you think about some of these like companies that have sort of these like extremely hardened environments, um, AppScript becomes an interesting option even then. So what I'm talking, when I say like sort of hardened environments, what I mean is like companies with things like, you know, mandatory hardware universal two-factor on logins. So places where like traditional credential phishing just isn't going to work because they have a hardware key that they actually have to hit in order to like log in. You know, the, the things like they have hardened Chromebooks with like lockdown enterprise policy. So you don't have things, you know, can't get a binary implant running on there. Uh, you know, you key key and you get the Chrome extensions potentially if they have like lockdown enterprise policy and they have, you know, hardware station and all that other good stuff, right? So like super lockdown environments. And so getting around these measures, you know, we're gonna have to think a little bit more clever than your average attacker. This isn't like the casual, like, you know, Windows networking style pen tests that are, you know, potentially more common. This is like a completely sort of unique uh, environment. And so we'll have to be a little bit more unique in how we think about it and how we approach these things. So I'm gonna go into some historical precedent here. Uh, one thing that I think is, uh, you know, a particularly interesting example is uh, what is the attack that happened a few years ago, which was essentially basically built around using, you know, Google's OAuth and API system. Some of you may recognize this screenshot here, you know, if, if you were one of the individuals that was affected by this, but essentially, you know, this was what was later dubbed as the Google, uh, you know, doc worm. Uh, so the way that this worked is it would essentially, you know, the, this worm uh, would basically send these phishing emails like this. And, you know, this would be from somebody you personally knew coming from their actual email address. And it would say like, hey, you know, your friend has invited you to view a document and it would give you this button to like, sort of like, okay, let's open that document. But when you actually went and did that, it would, it would actually present you with this OAuth prompt here. And it says like, hey, you know, Google Docs wants to have access to read, send, delete, and manage your email and also access all your contacts. Now, you know, of course, for security people watching this, they're like, well, I would never approve that prompt. But, you know, for the average user, they're sort of like looking at this and they're like, okay, Google Docs wants access to my Gmail and contacts. Yeah, I mean, I thought they would already have that. Sure, why not, right? And they would probably go through and just go ahead and approve this. So, you know, it's sort of like very, very convincing attack for a lot of, you know, the regular computer users. Of course, if they did do that and they did authorize, you know, this app to have access to their Google account, what it would immediately then go do is it would use the contact access to essentially get their thousand most recent contacts, you know, their their emails, their friends and coworkers and stuff like that, and it would send out this exact same phishing email as them to all of their friends and you know contacts, and this would basically repeat the cycle where they would then get that phishing email that we saw before, right? The impact of this attack was actually, you know, pretty, pretty impressive. It ended up spreading like wildfire and essentially it, it, it actually affected over a million Google users. And this is, you know, every, everything from like, you know, your personal Google users like you and me to sort of the big enterprise business users, you know, sort of the G Suite organizations. And, uh, you know, Google sort of rapidly responded to this actually, like they had really good response time. They did everything from like, you know, killed the emails that were spreading around, you know, killed off all the apps and stuff like that. And they did all of this in a couple hours. And after doing some post-mortem analysis on, you know, some, like basically the JavaScript that was used to control and run this attack, it turns out the coding for it was actually like pretty amateur, right? It wasn't like this advanced crazy nation state thing that most people assume. And it, you know, essentially looked like it was only collecting email addresses. So all things considered, this attack could have been, you know, much, much worse. It almost seemed as if, you know, in some ways that it was actually like unfinished. So, you know, let's break down this attack into its kind of core components here. Uh, one, you know, I would say like you know, 
fairly advanced thing trait that they did is they they did think ahead and they had multiple rotating apps. They registered multiple OAuth apps ahead of time, and they sort of randomized them along with different domains to essentially prevent the easy case of Google just like blocking their app or blocking a given domain. Right? They had to instead track down all of the apps and all the domains and block all of them to prevent this from spreading. It made use of some Unicode characters. You know, you saw it earlier. It was the, the app name was actually called Google Drive. That was because they were basically evading some filters, which normally prevented you from setting stuff like Google in the name of the app uh, by using Unicode characters, which look exactly the same as their you know ASCII equivalents. So it was like Google with like maybe a Swedish O, for example. And of course, you know, it used the the social engineering and the phishing scheme that we saw, which was you know quite convincing to people. And it actually, you know, it's self-propagated in sort of the old school email spam style, right? So it infects somebody, sends all of their contacts, you know, some of their, some of your friends end up like falling for it, you know, and then they send it to all their contacts as well. Except, you know, unlike the, you know, the email worms of old, this used some of the more modern OAuth style authentication and authorization to actually carry out these attacks as opposed to like old school credential harvesting and, you know, stuff like that. So as you can imagine, this was like pretty shocking to a lot of companies, a lot of users. And so Google made some pretty quick changes and mitigations after this happened. Uh, around two months later, they introduced a you know, G Suite admin control for sort of administrator, administrators of companies to essentially lock down their orgs. And the way that this would work is essentially, you know, it, they could publish it. They could basically set a setting that says like, none of my employees are allowed to grant access to any of their Google you know, account data for their employee account, um, unless it's for one of these explicit OAuth apps that I've explicitly allowed. So this would allow you to lock down to prevent, you know, if the, say this worm happened again, you know, their employees just straight up would not be able to grant these permissions to their account because it would be blocked unless it was whitelisted under their, you know, under this policy. And, uh, you know, Google later introduced what are called, uh, you know, sort of sensitive restricted scopes. So they basically labeled a bunch of you know, these permissions, as I mentioned before, as like either sensitive or restricted, depending on like the kind of data they would grant. And in addition to that, they introduced what's called, you know, unverified app warning prompt for the you know, smaller apps that require these scopes. And, you know, they went and they cracked down a lot of these other misleading OAuth apps, right? They beefed up their security around like what you can name an OAuth app to prevent sort of the same exact attack we saw before. So they can mimic Google style names and stuff like that as well. So just some quick, you know, food for thought here. Uh, this attack really didn't utilize a whole lot of like, you know, crazy zero day bugs or exploits, uh, you know, apart from, I guess, you know, some of the Unicode trickery for the name. It was basically kind of using the system as designed, right? Um, but the impact was actually like incredibly substantial, right? So that's something to really think about here is like, you know, you don't necessarily have to have one big bug or one exploit to sort of pull off these crazy attacks. You can simply abuse the system as it was designed and the design itself can just lend itself to attacks like this. Um, so just something to sort of think about in general with this, uh, the kind of this talk. So we talked about the history, let's go into like the latest, right? So all, with all mitigations in place, what can we bypass and what can we do in this sort of modern age? So, uh, you know, I talked earlier about the unverified app prompt. This is for apps, of course, that, you know, ask these sensitive scopes, and there's quite a few of them. So what it essentially, this is not like, you know, kind of a light warning. This is a really serious prompt that actually would dissuade users from continuing. It kind of takes, it looks like it sort of takes some tips from like, you know, Google Chrome's like UI for like invalid SSL, you know, sites that you visit. And so the way that the user can actually continue is they have to like click this little text that says like show advanced, you know, and they have to go down to the bottom and click through. And, you know, for the regular user, this is just not gonna be a tenable thing. They're just not gonna be able to get through this. And so it actually poses a significant barrier for us as attackers in order if we wanna, you know, fish a user via OAuth here. So what is a, you know, a sensitive or restricted scope? So that just means any API with the potential to access sort of like private data. Uh, so say, you know, this is everything from like Gmail, BigQuery, Google Cloud, Drive, Calendar. Uh, it's basically, it's actually a large percentage of the scope. So it's over 120 APIs. And the way that works is essentially if it's a small app, if it has less than 100 users, you have this unverified app prompt. And if the app is bigger than 100 users, you need to go through an even more strict process where you undergo sort of this intense manual review process. And this process is like no joke. Like there are like companies that have to use these scopes legitimately for like real world services that they provide. And they have written entire posts saying like, 
it's so hard for us to get past this review process, right? So it's like, it's, it's the real deal. And it's definitely not something that we could really cross if we were like a, an attacker trying to publish which is that, it's just not a tenable route for us. But there are some exceptions to this policy. So you take a look at the documentation around this. Essentially, you know, if you have the, if it is the case where you have some app script or an app and you know you use a sensitive scope and you fall into any of these categories, then you know either the normal auth flow without the unverified app prompt will happen or the unverified auth flow will happen. So one of these is particular, which is the intersection of these two. And essentially what this says is it says, you know, hey, if if the publisher of this app is in the same G Suite org as the user who's you know authorizing it and running it, then there'll be no unverified app prompt. And this this sort of makes sense, right? Like you can imagine you've got an employee who's uh, who works with you. They've created this app and they then share it with you, and you want to run it. You know, it doesn't really you, you trust them. There, it's an internal action, so it wouldn't really make sense to have this scary prompt because it's sort of viewed as internal and somewhat implicitly trustworthy. So that's something interesting. If we, could, if we could abuse that, we could essentially get around this. So one other thing to note about App Script is when you have an App Script app, it can be either a you know sort of a standalone project, a standalone script that runs, um, or they can be what is what's called you know bound to a container. And by container, this means like basically you can bind it to like a Google Doc or a sheet sl or a slide. And uh, you know when you do this, this allows you scripting to basically you know you can manipulate the document, uh, edge, customize the UI, stuff like that. And the way that works is essentially you know the, the regular triggers I talked about before. They'll run for any user who basically has edit access to the doc. So they have to have edit access to the doc, and then they can kick off any of these app script triggers and sort of run this app. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, they still have to you know accept the OAuth prompts if they're requesting any you know scopes. So if you imagine sort of our, our average, you know, OAuth phishing scenario, right? Say we set, we have a Google Doc with some app script attached to it, and we send our victim this link who's inside of this G Suite org. Uh, when they go to actually, you know, they, they open the doc and they trigger it and, you know, the prompt spawns, they of course get the, you know, hey, Google hasn't verified this app. Um, it's requesting sensitive scopes. And so likely the victims would be like, nah, this isn't for me. I don't even know how to get through this. And so our, you know, our attempt is probably gonna fail here, right? So one interesting thing about Google Docs and Sheets and Slides and you know all this stuff is that if you change the average URL that you get, you know, from edit to copy, uh, instead of just directly opening to like this document interface, uh, you'll actually get uh, this prompt instead. And so this essentially, you know, this prompt here says, "Hey, do you want to make a copy of, in this case, you know, confidential or glide comp and promo details?" And they get a little button that says, "Say, make a copy." And when they click this, what ends up happening is it copies the you know the document, the sheet into their own Google Drive, and then it, they're immediately taken to the you know the full uh, UI interface for you know working with the sheet. And so you know going back to the attack I mentioned earlier, so now if we're an attacker and we send our victim this copy link instead of the regular link, uh, when they go through this and they, they click to make a copy of it. Uh, they'll essentially like it copies into their Google Drive, and then when they trigger, you know, the app script that's attached to it, they will get the regular prompt without this unverified app screen. And the reason why they get this is because if you if you look at the app itself, you'll notice that the actual developer behind the app is the victim. And the reason why it's the victim is because when they copied that doc, what they ended up doing was essentially they became the creator because they copied the doc. They are now the creator and owner of the script. And so they'll actually see that they themselves are requesting the permission from themselves. So there is one problem though. So when you actually copy, you know, one of the, a document with app scripts attached to it, the triggers don't come along from the ride. So they don't really have a way to trigger this thing to get this prompt to display. So that's kind of a that's kind of a pain. So one way that we can get around this problem is uh, Google Sheets have what are called macros. And this is sort of something you know made to compete with like you know Microsoft Excel's like VB script style stuff to like manipulate and automate spreadsheets. Um, but what's useful about the Google Sheets version is they can call arbitrary app scripts. And what's even more useful is you can actually, uh, if you have like an image or you know item in your uh, Google Sheets, you can assign a macro. So like when somebody clicks on the image, it will automatically run this macro, which you know by proxy runs any arbitrary app script that you want. And so this, you know, basically is a great way to sort of like trigger your app script payload. So I've got a little demo here where you can see the victim, you know, they go in here and they click 
make a copy of this of this Google Sheets. And after they've clicked that button, they take them directly to your copied sheet, and you see this beautiful image of this goose with this butter knife looking totally not threatening at all. And when they go to click on that, they get the authorization prompt. And when they click continue, you can see they have you know the regular OAuth prompt, no warnings at all. So we've essentially bypassed that whole restriction around unverified apps. But that's not actually all that we've bypassed. So in addition to bypassing the unverified app you know, screen, we've also, you know, I mentioned earlier this in, the, in a little bit earlier in the talk, but that you know, G Suite admin setting that allows you to basically like lock down your organization to prevent third party OAuth apps from requesting permissions uh, on your employees' accounts. This actually gets around that as well. Uh, this is this entire system is essentially bypassed, and the reason for that is exactly the same reason as the you know, reason for bypassing the unverified app prompt, because the app is owned by you know it's basically when the copy into the, is made into the Google Drive of the you know the victim, and uh, they're inside the org. Essentially, like this makes means that the OAuth app itself is considered the new owner. It's there, it's an internal app, so it's not a third party app. It's actually first party. It's inside the org. And so this doesn't apply, you know, this block on all third-party API access, it doesn't apply. And so this is bypassed as well. So another, you know, fun tip for sort of defeating the, the both the you know, third-party app uh, restrictions and the unfair verified app prompt is that, you know, uh, if you go through the docs, you realize that, you know, the, the doc that, that's attached to like the app script and vice versa, they have the same owner. And so what's interesting about this is, is say you have somebody who's created a new Google Sheet or doc or whatever inside of their G Suite domain. Uh, when they've created that, that's actually a, kind of a bypass willing to happen because if they share edit access with anybody outside of the organization, uh, that person with their edit access can actually go in and they can like then create some app script for that document. And the owner is still the person that created the, you know, the doc or the sheet in the first place, right? So it, since that sticks, now you can essentially use that to start off your, you know, your phishing or whatever attempt, right? Because that will bypass all of the, you know, third-party and unverified app restrictions that we talked about previously, because it will be owned by the employee that first created this document. So if you can find one of these, uh, you know, this is a great starting place where you can sort of skip the whole copy style attack. So we talked about how to sort of like pierce the perimeter. Uh, now let's go into sort of like once you've got some access, you've, you maybe you compromised when we have one one employee uh, G Suite account. Uh, where do you go past then, right? What can you pivot to? You know, how can you escalate privileges? So likely, you know, it, most companies, I'd say probably the most interesting data they have is in you know, Google Cloud, and so pivoting to Google Cloud from your app script implant seems pretty important. So accessing Google Cloud through App Script is not super documented, but you can do it uh, by basically requesting the scope cloud platform. And that actually gives you access to all GCP APIs. So everything from like BigQuery to Google Cloud Functions, GCE, all of it, uh, as the user who basically you know, authorizes access to, you know, to your app, right? So the way that you essentially authenticate to these APIs is you use the App Script uh, function scriptapp.getOAuth token. You take that value, you put it in the authorization bearer header, and you can use that to authenticate to all of the APIs. But when you do this, there's kind of a gotcha. So you'll notice that when you try to use this for the Google you know, GCP APIs, you're gonna get this you know, warning that says like, uh, you know, API that you're trying to access. It's not been used in this project ID, you know, this number before. You know, either it's not been used or it's disabled. Uh, so this, this, this request has failed. Um, what's even more strange is, you know, the product number that's displayed, it's not going to be for the product that you're even, you know, trying to access. So what's the deal with this here? Again, not super well documented, but essentially when, you know, you create a new app script app, uh, upon that creation, you're allocated a sort of hidden Google Cloud project that's, that's immediately attached to this app script app and associated with it. Um, and so what happens is like this implicitly binds your API request that you make from your, you know, access token generated by your implant uh, with this project. So it just sort of like, that's why you have this arbitrary project number. It's for this hidden project. And you, unfortunately for the hidden project, you can't like access it via the Google Cloud control panel or anything like that. You can't enable services on it, uh, use like programmatically like you normally would be able to. And so this is kind of a big problem, right? Well, it turns out that uh, you can actually get around this by specifying uh, the x goog user project header. And you simply specify the product name that you're trying to query, right? So, you so if you're going for like, uh, 
you want to modify a project example, uh, you do this header and then set it to that value. That basically looks like this, you know, set your project ID and your API calls, set it in the header, and then you put your authorization bear header to that script, to the um, script app that get OAuth token value that I mentioned before. And you can, you know, go on, you can talk to all the GCP APIs to your heart's content, right? If the data you're looking for doesn't happen to be, you know, the good stuff isn't in Google, you know, Google Cloud, then it's probably in Google Drive, right? Maybe like more financial driven companies, all their stuff is in Sheets and Drive. And so let's talk about sort of mining Google Drive for the good stuff. We'll begin with kind of a, the general overview of how sharing works in Google Drive. So by default in G Suite, there's essentially like these three permission levels. The most restricted, you know, sharing settings for a file is that you know, only people who are explicitly added to the ACL are allowed to access the document. So you basically have to go one by one and add different, you know, other users and to give them access to it. And if they aren't on the list, they cannot view the document, right? They can't access it. So the second level is, you know, anybody who has a link to the document or the file, they can access it. So you essentially are sharing by link. So if they have a link, they can access it, but if they don't, they, they can't, right? And then the, the widest, most open setting is you can even make it so that, hey, anybody who just searches inside of the Drive web page, they can find your internal doc by doing that, right, if they're also in the company. So, you know, th th these are the defaults. Essentially, you know, by default, it has the strictest sharing settings where you have to explicitly add people. One click away from that, the most restrictive settings is like share by link with everybody you know, who has the link. They can access the document. And then, you know, if you do more clicks, you can get it searchable by everybody, right? And of course, you know, once somebody view, if it is shared by link, right, and somebody else views it, uh, once they view it once, it becomes searchable in the future because, you know, the, the assumption is like you you have the link, you should be able to find it again because you were able to visit it once. These, your, these you know, unique document URLs are uh, outside of the range of brute forcing. So if somebody does share by link, you're not going to be able to brute force you know, the actual link itself. You're going to have to ha actually have it. So we talked about, you know, sort of like what the, the default and what the setting system is, but real world usage tends to be quite different than sort of the strictly technical bits, right? So what actually ends up happening? So in my experience, usually what ends up happening is, you know, if a file is important, almost, almost kind of by definition, right? It's going to be shared with other people, right? Other people are going to view this document. They're going to maybe make changes, suggestions to it. And so, uh, you know, in the strictest security setting that we mentioned previously, you know, the per owner of the doc is going to have to add individual, individual users one by one. And that's a very tedious process, especially when you have, like, say you're doing like 40 people, right? That's, ex that's very time consuming. And, you know, you can use Google groups to sort of like, you know, put together ACL groups that can be added in bulk together, but it's still a very tedious process, right? So what often ends up happening is people get to a point where they're just like, they share it with so many people that they're just like, ah, forget it, right? And they just like share by link with a large, you know, anybody who has a link, like they're good to view it. So in practice, that tends to be like pretty, pretty common, right? And only a tiny portion end up being like that wide searchable mode that we talked about before, just because the amount of user interaction required. So how do we get access to these, you know, so this big area, which is like, you know, stuff that's shared by link. So of course there's the, there's the you know, basic method, which is just like, I'll uh, search all the internally shared systems inside of a company. Let's check, you know, the, the chat, let's check, you know, internal forums, you know, internal Q and A sites, um, like your ticket management queues, Jira, whatever, uh, bug trackers and try to mine out and look for all these, you know, Google doc drive links. Uh, you can do that, uh, but there's also another way to do it, which is actually the same way that we do it on the web, right? How we index and you know, make documents uh, searchable on the web. And so the way this works essentially is, you know, you can have a script which will simply like take some seed, you know, Google Drive links and Google Sheets docs links. And it will essentially like, it'll go through each one of them. So say you give a Google Sheet, it'll go through that, it'll parse it, it'll find all the links inside of that document. And it will recursively crawl all of those documents as well and look for links inside them and so forth and so on until it essentially is able to like enumerate all of these other documents, which are sort of like indirectly linked to via all these other documents, right? So I've written a, you know, an app script spider that does exactly this, which you can essentially do what I just described, right? Take some seed links, plug it in. It uses a start, starting point and basically recursively crawls all this stuff until it's exhausted all the past. And it gives you like, you know, along the way it collects like metadata about sharing, you know, document context, the authors and stuff like that. So you can essentially like let it run 
gather up all these documents and you can then like look through the results to see if it has the data that you're looking for. This is available at this GitHub link here. So feel free to take a look. Another useful thing to do is to, uh, is to basically request scope access for the people API. And so what this is, this is essentially like every, you know, with G Suite, it ships with this really neat ability actually to, uh, it comes with like an internal uh, employee directory. And so with the people API, if you request the directory dot read only scope uh, at a minimum, you can access, you know, you can figure out all the other employees in the G Suite org and you can get everything from like, you know, names, emails, titles, whatever it is. And this becomes extremely useful, uh, it's something that you probably want to collect early on. So say you first compromise a G Suite employee, you want to use this like to immediately mine all this data out because say you, know, you get revoked uh, by an administrator who catches you or you know, they basically figure out, oh, they, you did this phishing campaign and they you know, revoke your app, delete all of your implant stuff. Um, so having this data is very, very useful for reentry because you can make a much, much more well-planned attack now that you have a good idea of their, you know, their entire organization via this API. So highly recommend uh, this as, a, as an avenue. So let's talk about escalating our privileges, right? Let's let's sort of like talk about how we can you know, increase what privileges we have and get access to more things. So one thing that is you know, very a very good source of privilege escalation is like legitimate internal uh, app script apps that are developed by people inside of a G Suite organization that are attached to you know Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, stuff like that. So recall earlier we talked about app script as being able to be you know we talked about being bound to you know a, a doc or a sheet or a slide, and this uh, file that a script is bound to is called its container. And so one of the things we have to ask ourselves is like, say you have some app script that's attached to a doc, right? Uh, so in this case, do they have separate ACLs? Like, can you make it so they can only edit the script but not the doc? Uh, how, does that, how does that work exactly? So if you read the Google documentation, uh, they actually share their ACL exactly with its container, right? So if you have a, a Google doc with some app script attached and uh, you know somebody has edit permission on the doc, they by proxy have edit permission to the script as well. So this leads to some more interesting questions, right? So you recall that edit access is required, as I mentioned earlier, to even run the app script that's attached to a doc. So they can't even you know, use your application unless they have edit access to your doc. But if they have edit access to the doc or sheet or slide or whatever, then they also have access to be able to edit the app script that's attached to it. So how does this work? We have a bunch of people that are all sharing the same you know, you know, doc or sheet or slide and using the app script attached to it. So, you know, in this given situation, right, you have like one app, say this is like got access to like these employees like Google Drive, you know, BigQuery, stuff like that. It's automating some process for them. They're all have, they all have to be granted editor access on the doc in order to be able to use the app script. And, you know, they're all sort of sharing it together. So they've all authorized this, you know, thing to access their services on, on their behalf. And then, you know, you have one user that's malicious. And of course they have editor access on the doc. They go in, use their editor access to modify the app script attached to the doc to contain, you know, instead of the legitimate script, a malicious payload that does something nefarious, right? Maybe it like it, maybe it like exfiltrates the docs that they have access to that the attacker doesn't have access to, something like that. And then when the regular users come along and they trigger the app script like they regularly do, right? Um, the, the malicious code now runs as them. So this becomes, you know, it's basically very, very hard to, to write an app like this securely because, you know, just in the way that the system is designed, you have to give people added access. And when you do that, then they have access to edit the app script. And so any shared, you know, documents is, with scripts attached to them become very exploitable. So we can do actually even do one better than this. So, you know, this previous attack kind of implies that you have to wait around for these people to trigger this app script that's attached to the doc. And, as attackers, we're often quite impatient. We'd rather force this to happen like right now. So this can be done essentially by, you can force a retrigger by basically going to the app script and you can publish a web endpoint. And when you publish this, you essentially get a URL. And that URL, if it's visited by any of these users that have authorized this app, it will immediately trigger the script to execute as them. And this is this is actually really nice because it doesn't, it's not just like they have to visit it, like in their web browser, they can visit a web page that simply has an image in it that links to this URL, and it will completely. If that works completely fine. It will execute the you know script as them just from like an image that links to this. So the way that you do this is you just go to like the deploy menu in your app script, 
you do a new deployment, you do a deployment type of web app, and you simply say like, hey, when people hit this endpoint, uh, I want it to run as the user who's accessing the web app and you know deploy it. When you do that, you get this nice little URL back, and this is what you can basically do to like, you know, you can put this inside of an image tag or something, or somehow get the victim to visit this in their web browser, and this will you know, trigger the script to automatically run as them. So another useful technique for you know, lateral movement inside of a G Suite organization is enumerating and joining uh, open Google Groups. So to talk about Google Groups, right, you know, Google Groups are used for ACL in both, you know, Google Cloud, you know, in GCP IAM settings and for a variety of like G Suite style services, right? So they're used extensively in ACL, but in addition to that, they're by default when you create a Google Group instead of a G Suite org, uh, they're openly joinable by everybody internally. So by themselves, neither is an issue, but when you put them together, this is actually not so great, right? You know, something that's used extensively for ACLs being by default, you know, widely open and insecure. So anybody inside the company can join and basically grant the permissions of this ACL just by joining your group. This ends up being kind of a basically a factory for endless privilege escalation, right? So oftentimes searching and joining Google Groups is a great way to just like, you know, escalate your privileges inside of a Google, you know, G Suite organization. So what all can be gated by Google Groups? So we mentioned like Google Cloud and all the services under it, right? App Engine, you know, Google Cloud Functions, but it's also stuff like, you know, Google Drive, Docs, Sheets, whatever. Uh, things like Google Calendar, you know, Data, you know, Data Studio, and even like G Suite admin ACL groups. And it can even be used for stuff like, you know, publishing Chrome extensions. So, you know, most, most Google services have some sort of ACL integration with Google Groups. So tons of places to escalate your privileges. So talking about this in the context of like, if you have an app script implant, you know, unfortunately modifying Google groups uh, via app script is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, for some reason, unlike a lot, all the other like, you know, sort of Google services, uh, the Google groups uh, API is, which is known as like the directory API, it's restricted only to admins. Um, so only G Suite admins can actually like uh, utilize the API. Uh, but there is another API, which is called the Cloud Identity API, and that is available to all users. So your AppScript implant could make use of it. And this allows you know, some access to Google Groups via the API. So some of the stuff that you can do with this is you can like list all the Google Groups in a given organization. You can list you know, the members of the groups, their roles, and you can also, you know, uh, you can create your own Google Groups. You can update them, delete members, you know, stuff like that. And you can manage stuff that you create. But unfortunately, the one thing you cannot do via this API is you can't join an open Google group, which is you know super unfortunate. But you know if you if you did have like that if you did have like the full level access to the G Suite account, um, joining open Google groups is a great way to you know sort of escalate your privileges. So now that we talked about escalation, let's talk about you know sort of like stealth and persistence, right? When you get access to a victim, you don't you don't want point in time, you want like persistent access so you can keep fooling around inside of the organization. We'll start off by talking about some Gmail trickery. One of the things that I recommend with your app script implant uh, using your API access to, to Gmail is create uh, filters uh, in Gmail to essentially hide security notifications. So things like the emails that say, hey, you just granted access to a new uh, you know, Google app. Um, those kind of notifications, you can hide them from the user. Uh, you can also create a bunch of filters to like hide password reset emails. So you can like, you know, basically when somebody gets an inbound password reset email, you can like hide it in either their trash or like some other folder so that they don't see it. And since people's email accounts tend to be like the center of like all their security, uh, you can then basically, you know, if, if like later on, you know, you can essentially do resets for all these sub accounts, use the app script to pull the password reset email and then thus get access to them. Unfortunately, you know, when it comes to like, uh, creating and um, forwarding addresses and stuff like this in Gmail, you can't do this via the API. But we will talk about, you know, if you have like the full access to their account, uh, if you have like the full UI access to Gmail, you can do uh, something that's called adding a forwarding address. And so this is super useful for persisting access. Essentially the way that it works is you can set it so that you have like an external mailbox, so like something at yahoo.com or whatever the external email is. And you can make it so that, you know, anything that matches a given filter or even just every email they receive, a copy of that email will automatically be sent to this other email box, right? So this way you can basically get a copy of all their stuff that's coming into them. And you can set this to like either, you know, delete the email or just like, just make a copy and 
you know, not, not make any changes. So this is a super good way to like sort of keep persistent access to their stuff, even if you end up getting revoked uh, from, you know, or ripped out later on. So one of the things we talked about with this, you know, historical campaign where they used, you know, an app name of Google Drive, uh, having a deceptive app name is quite useful. Um, so you can tell that you can see here in this little demo, if, if I try to set my uh, app script app name to Google Docs, uh, when you actually go to the permission prompt there, it shows, you know, it won't, it won't actually do it for you, right? It says like, it'll basically deny it says, you know, it's still on title project. It won't set it to Google Doc because that's a misleading name. It knows you're trying to like do something fishy there. So it essentially prevents you from setting a app name like that. But, uh, you know, and if you look into like some, some of the, some of the stuff that they've implemented after this, you know, Google Doc worm came out. Um, all of the sort of like when they were doing the tricks with the Unicode characters to like essentially get the same looking name to like an official Google product, all of that has been pretty well stripped out. Like they have a good system for like preventing you from setting like G Swedish O O G L docs, right? All of that's prevented. <laughs> None of the no wit space tricks, any of that works. But I did find that uh, you can use what's uh, the magic of what's called the right to left override character. So for those of you that aren't familiar, what this is, is this, it's a Unicode character that you can paste in. And when you paste it, all of the all the characters that come after it end up getting put in reverse. And so in this case, you can see I basically paste the character in and then I go on to type in Google Docs backwards. And because this is reversed from you know right to left instead of left to right, it actually appears in the prompt as Google Docs, right? So we've completely bypassed this protection by using this. And when the user actually goes to approve this, they will just see Google Docs, just as they did it with the you know, initial sort of Google Docs worm. So another thing we want to do, right, is likely perpetual, you know, app script execution. So we want, you know, our script to continually uh, have access to their account. We don't just want to like, they authorize it, it runs once, that's it. We want to, you know, keep access, keep persistence and keep around so we can, you know, figure out what's inside the org and do our thing. So AppScript has a really useful feature, which is, you know, time-based triggers this is sort of cron style stuff that I mentioned earlier. And this allows for, you know, background ex execution on a schedule. And this can be run as often as like every minute. And it executes, of course, as whatever user was running the script that ended up programmatically creating this trigger, right? So you can see some example code here. We've got script app. Uh, you know, dot new trigger, it creates one that runs every minute, and this will run our, you know, sum function call every minute or so. Now, if you read the Google, you know, the, the documentation on this, it says, you know, in order to do this, in order to run these background scripts, you need to request this specific scope, which is script dot script app. And this will cause this, like, you know, human, this little thing to come up in your OAuth prompt that says, hey, allow this application to run when you're not present. So it explicitly warns the user that this is, you know, not, this is running in the background. It will run continuously even after you've approved it once. Uh, so it turns out that this is more of a suggestion than there's a hard rule. Um, they say you need to do this, but as it, you know, turns out, it's more of a suggestion, really. You can still create time triggers programmatically without declaring the scope. And, uh, you know, as long as you declare some other scope of any type, like Google Drive, you know, Gmail, whatever it is, uh, as long as they authorize those, uh, you can programmatically create time triggers all you want, and they'll execute just fine. Um, so you can use those to persist, persist indefinitely without any of this sort of OAuth warnings to the user. So more of a guideline than a strict rule. So great, you know, we've covered a, a variety of topics here around, you know, how you can sort of do everything from like pierce the perimeter, escalate privileges, pivot around, persist and stuff like that. Um, so thank you all for taking the time to see my talk and uh, be happy to answer any questions that you have.